Um, so, hi, my name is Shannon Bell. I, uh, I work with, for stormwater planning in Fairfax County. Um, this is Justin's project, um, Paul Spring at Sherwood Hall. It's going to be a stream restoration. Um, Justin just had a baby today, so he is unable to make this presentation. So I'm going to be stepping in, stepping in for him and kind of presenting all the information that he has to show you on the project. Um, so... Yeah, let's, let's get started. Um, so I already said who I am, Shannon Bell. Um, Justin is the project manager um, and he'll usually be doing all these meetings, but for now, here I am. Um, so then we have some of our design team with us today. You guys wanna go? Hi, I'm Greg Fox with A. Morton Thomas. Um, yeah, I'm the design consultant doing the study and hydrology and geomorphology and um, you know putting together all the packages for permits and construction. I had I had uh, Joe Howard was gonna join us today but he had a family emergency not not a baby today but just a family emergency so um, you're you're stuck with just me. Um, all right. So I guess we can get started. Um, put together a presentation um, that I want to share with you guys. Most disabled participant screen share. Um, I can't share the screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, Cause it looks like Justin has joined the meeting again. Megan or Megan Fellows is also from Fairfax County and she's gonna help out be the moderator for the meeting. Um, I don't know if I'm still a host anymore, Megan. It looks like you're the host. Yeah, Shannon, you're not a co-host anymore. All right, I'm the host again. I can share my screen, perfect. Sorry about that, guys. Um, all right, so here is our presentation. Um, as I said earlier, this is for the Paul Spring branch of Sherwood Hall. Um, we're doing extreme restoration here. Uh, so what I wanted to go over with you guys in the meeting is uh, first we're going to do introductions, then I'll give like a quick background on the stormwater planning program, um, why we do what we're doing. Then I want to talk about the existing site conditions. We'll go over our design goals in the process. Um, then we could talk about our pre-conceptual design, Greg's gonna take over, um, talk to you all about what AMT has put together for the project so far. And then we'll talk about the next steps. Um, so what's gonna happen after this. Uh, so the project team um, is gonna be the Civic Association and the residents and other community organizations um, around the area. We really appreciate everybody's input and I'm glad that all of you were able to take time out of your schedule to come to this meeting today. Um, your opinion really does matter to us. You guys are gonna have to live with this project. Um, it's your backyards. We wanna make sure that you're happy with what we're giving you. Um, so along with the community, we have stormwater planning division. We're gonna oversee this project from beginning to end. And then even afterwards, we're gonna check up on it, make sure everything's working properly. Um, so we are invested in this. We're not just going to leave you um, once construction is completed. So A. Morton Thomas is our design engineer. Um, so we're going to work with them. They're going to put everything together, stormwater planning and the community and the whole rest of the design team will have a chance to review their deliverables, make sure that it's everything we want it to be. Um, but we're excited to have A. Morton Thomas as our engineer for this project. Um, then we have the land acquisition division. Um, so as I'll talk about later in the project, there are going to be a lot of easements um, that we're going to have to acquire. 
for this project to be successful. So our land acquisition division is gonna help us with that process. Um, so they'll review all the plats and make sure everything looks correct. Um, then after we get our design and all the easements and everything kind of tied up, our utility design and construction division is gonna take over the project um, and they'll oversee all the construction for it so us in stormwater planning and AMT is still going to be involved to make sure that what they're building is what we've shown on the plans. Um, but UDCD will take care of like managing the contractor and things like that. Um, and then during design and construction, we're going to be working with our urban forest management division, the wastewater planning division, wastewater collections. And um, so we'll work with those three agencies, um, urban forestry, obviously they deal with the forests and trees and stuff like that. So um, we'll, during the design, we'll look at the trees that we're impacting and we'll consult with them to make sure that everything we're doing is, is appropriate. And then wastewater, um, any sanitary crossings or sanitary lines that are on the site, we're gonna coordinate with them to make sure that we're doing everything within their standards. Um, so then after everything's done, site's constructed, um, we'll bring in our maintenance and stormwater management division, um, which is like the sister agency sort of stormwater planning. They will help manage the project um, after construction is completed. So even during the design, we'll show them everything to see if they have any comments on like how they can better maintain the project. So that's our project team. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about stor our stormwater program and the stormwater planning division and why we actually exist. Um, so there are a lot of laws and regulations that Fairfax County is required to meet. Um, they're listed on here, like a Clean Water Act, the Municipal Separate Stormwater Permit, um, and the Chesapeake Bay requirements. Like those are all things that Fairfax um, has to meet the requirements for. Um, and we have certain, like, pollutant rates that we need to remove every year, every five years. And in order to do that, we have to do projects like the stream restoration or pond retrofits or stormwater projects throughout the county. Um, so stream restorations are probably the most beneficial way, most economic way for us to meet these requirements because we get the biggest benefit from them. So that's why, that's why we're here today um, to talk about it. So let's start talking about the project a little bit. Um, this is, so the project is located in the Little Hunting Creek watershed. Um, this is a map that was drawn by General George Washington. So, I mean, it's been around for a long time and I think it's pretty cool that uh, George Washington kind of sketched something up back in the day. So since um, 1762, the watershed has developed um, a little bit. And it is actually one of the most developed watersheds in Fairfax County with about 80% of the land being developed. It's about two square miles, um, which is pretty significant. Um, so that's just a little background on what the watershed looks like. Here is a map of the project area. Um, it's highlighted in red with this hatching. Um, and that shows where, what our approximate project boundaries are. So the project's gonna run from Sherwood Hall Lane up here down to Calling, Callingham, Collingwood Road, sorry. Um, and then along Mason Hall Lane uh, to Fort Hunt Road and uh, Paul Spring Parkway. So those are sort of the roads that bound the project just to give you guys an idea of where our work is gonna be located. Um, so I wanted to show you some existing conditions of the stream. I'm sure you guys have seen it, but just in case you haven't, this is, this is the, some idea of what we're looking at. Um, so as you can see from the picture, like the, there are raw banks, um, which means that there's a lot of bank erosion happening, which is sending sediments and nutrients downstream, which ultimately will go to the Chesapeake Bay and just add to the, the pollutant load that's in there. So one of the goals of our project is to help reduce that sediment load from going downstream um, and just improve the water quality. Uh, so I wanted to, so while we were out looking at the project, um, we took some 
measurements on what the stream channel size was, and it's approximately 30 feet wide and five feet deep. Um, based on regional curve data, it looks like streams with the drainage area of what this project has um, is the dimensions of the stream should be about 15 feet wide and one and a half feet deep. So as you can see, this stream is larger than what it needs to be. Um, and then just to kind of give you some background, regional curve data is developed by looking at dimensions from stable streams in the region, or we like to call them reference reaches. Um, and they're used to size the stream channel they are used to size stream channels appropriately based on their drainage area using the natural, using natural channel design methods. Um, and natural des channel design methods are stream restoration methods that emulate um, natural streams. So some of our project goals, like I mentioned earlier, were are to improve water quality. Um, in order to do that, we want to help. We want to stabilize the stream bed and banks. This is going to help reduce um, sediment and nutrient inputs into the system. We want to improve floodplain connectivity. Um, this is going to increase the frequency and resonance time of water on the floodplain and reduce erosion. Um, and then just to give you guys an idea of what a floodplain is. So right here, this is the stream, a floodplain. So this is like the channel. A floodplain is going to be when the stream kind of fills up and then spills out into the land that's surrounding the stream. So that's the floodplain. So it's a larger area than what the actual stream is. Um, we also want to improve habitat and ecological processes. Um, we will do this by installing native landscaping um, and making the stream more regener regenerative. Um, we also want to look at protecting the existing natural resources. This is really important to us. We want to try and minimize tree loss as much as we can. So while we're designing the stream, we're going to look at um, avoiding the really high quality forested areas. Um, and we're also going to use the existing channel as much as possible. I think there, Greg's going to talk about this later, but I think there are some sections of the stream where we are going to have to um, realign it. But for definitely some long stretches, we're gonna try and utilize that existing channel as much as possible. And that's definitely gonna help reduce the tree loss. Um, so we're also gonna try and protect the, the current infrastructure that's out there, including the sanitary and water lines. Um, and we wanna maintain close coordination with the stakeholders through meetings such as these. Um, so then we also have some social goals for this project, and they are to maintain open dialogue and share information as much as we can. Uh, we want to coordinate with the stakeholders in the community. Like I said, that's going to be done through meetings like these. We'll also have some, uh, we'll have uh, like a design charrette meeting in the field where we can walk it with the community and show you guys what we're actually looking at. And then we want to build partnerships with local organizations. So if there's any interested organizations in the area, we would love to get your input. Um, so now that we've talked about our project goals, um, let's talk about what we're actually going to get. So doing our stream restoration, um, we're going to get some water quality benefits. We're really all early in the process right now, so we haven't calculated this for our project yet, but this is just an example of what it's going to look like. Um, so this example um, was for Flat Lake Branch, which is about 4,600 linear feet. This project is about 12,000 linear feet, so it's almost three times as big. Um, so our loads um, our removal rates are going to be a lot higher than what this project is. So that'll be great. Um, so now I just want to kind of give you guys like a brief overview of stream restorations, uh, just so you guys can be a little more knowledgeable on what we're going to be doing out there. Um, I know this is a lot of information, but hopefully you guys will be able to get a, a better idea. So this is the stream functions pyramid. Um, and it's just a way to, uh, to kind of see how streams work. Um, so there are five main functions of the stream that support in creating a healthy stream corridor. 
Um, as you can see, geology and climate are at the bottom of the pyramid, and they determine what type of stream it is. Um, so streams in Arizona with arid climates look significantly different than streams in the forested Piedmont, Virginia. So your geology and climate is kind of going to determine what type of stream you're going to have. So the first layer of our pyramid is hydrology. Hydrology is the transport of water through the watershed. So a watershed is like the area that drains down to the stream. So when I mentioned earlier, the Little Hunting Creek watershed is like two square miles. Um, so we'll figure out how much area drains down to this project and then size our stream from there. Um, so the next level on the pyramid is hydraulic, the hydraulic function. Um, the, and this is how water flows through the channel and in the floodplain. The hydrology and the hydraulics work together to determine the volume and speed in which the stream, stream flows. So this next tier up here is kind of based on the stream flow that we get from these two tiers. Um, and it is the transport of wood and sediments in the stream to create diverse bed forms. Uh, so as I said, these first two levels um, determine the flow which impacts the stream by transporting materials. Um, this transformation forms different flow sections like pools and riffles throughout the stream. Um, so then these three feed to, to determine what these two levels are. So then we move up to the physiochemical and biology levels. Um, physiochemical includes temperature, oxygen, and nutrients levels, and then biology is the biodiversity of the stream. So these lower three tiers of the pyramid are the cause, which we can modify with natural channel design, and the top two are the effect. If we're able to improve the hydrology, hydraulics, or geomorphology, then we'll be able to support a more diverse aquatic life. Um, but this is also dependent on the quality of the upstream portions of the stream. So if we have a really, like, if we're downstream of a major city, you're probably not going to have the best, like, aquatic life um, because the water is polluted. Or if you're downstream from, I mean, it just depends on what your upstream area is, um, along with how we're able to improve the stream. Um, so then next we have um, hydrology and channel evolution. So this diagram kind of shows what happens with development over time. So that George Washington picture that we showed in the very beginning, his sketch, a lot of the watershed was probably undeveloped. Um, so that means that the water is able to infiltrate into the ground. Um, it's it, there's very little overland flow. It's a lot of the water is evaporated. Like I, so since there isn't a lot of overland flow, that means the streams aren't getting overwhelmed. Like they're, they're doing great. But as we start building houses, you can see that this runoff starts increasing. And as the runoff starts increasing, that means that we're starting to overwhelm the streams. The streams are only used to this nice forested condition where they barely get any water, but now we're sending so much water to them. And we're not really getting that deep infiltration and the regular infiltration that we used to. It's all going straight to the streams and that's not what the streams were expecting. So they evolve. Um, so here is a graphic that shows the stream evolution model. So as you can see up here in stage zero, so this is broken up into eight stages um, and it just kind of shows how streams progress. So stage zero, is like a really nice for forested condition. So if you went back in time um, with George Washington, all the streams would be braided. They wouldn't be in size. They wouldn't be cut really deep. Like it'd just be nice little streams that you could like hop across. Um, but over time with more development, they start degrading. And when you start getting more water, they just start cutting down lower. Um, so you can kind of follow this. So as it goes in, um, the trees start falling down because it's getting so deep that the sides aren't able to support it anymore. So then the sides start collapsing in and that's when the stream starts widening out. 
Um, so typically in Fairfax County, a lot of the streams we see kind of get stuck in this phase here where they're degrading and widening and they never really make it to the healing process, um, which happens over here. So after, after they start winding, widening, they start degrading. Um, and these, this portion of the stream evolution model can take up to a thousand years to achieve. So it's really easy to degrade the stream, but actually healing the stream is going to take a really long time. So with our stream restorations, we want to try and speed up that process and resize the channels to be what they want to be um, and help connect them back to the floodplain. So here is kind of another way to look at it. So this is more like a 2D model of what's happening. Like we're just seeing the cross-sectional view of the stream, just like in two dimensions. Here's an idea of, so here's our 2D model, but then here's the 3D. So you can see it's kind of the same thing. We're talking about the stream deepening, widening, um, but here it also moves. It doesn't stay in the same place. Um, so this is more like a 3D model of what's going on. Um, so natural channel design, I briefly touched on this earlier. Um, this is the type of method that we use for our stream restoration projects. Um, so there are four different priorities. There's a priority one, which reconnects the flows to the floodplain. This is what we're going to be doing on this project. Um, this is probably, it minimizes tree loss um, compared to some of these other methods. Priority two, sorry, um, we would be re, we would be cutting a new floodplain bench out of the existing ground. And that's not something that we really are a fan of because of the amount of tree loss that's gonna be associated with that. So we wanna try and save as many of the trees as we can. Um, so in a priority three restoration, these typically happen in really urban um, developed areas where you have houses on both sides and there isn't really a lot of room to wiggle. Um, so we just kind of filled the channel in a little bit and then do like a small floodplain bench instead of reconnecting to the floodplain up here where we can utilize all this area. Um, we can't utilize this area here because then we'll be flooding houses. So we gotta, we gotta limit our expectations and just do a small floodplain. And then priority four um, is just stabilizing in place. And this is not ideal because it isn't long-term. And we want our projects to be long-term because we're going to be putting a lot of effort into this. So we want to we make it the best it can be. Um, so here are some pictures of what, what our projects typically look like. Um, so as you can see, we try to minimize stream loss tree loss as much as we can. So we limit our construction to the areas where we only need to be. Um, one of our main big goals is um, establishing native vegetation. And then we also will use rate control and to create more floodplain connectivity um, in the stream. So some of the structures that we use, um, and then these are also pictures of projects that we have completed in the past. So this is a cross vein. Um, a cross vein is a rock structure. It is a grade control structure and it will help reduce stream bank erosion. And it has um, a pool down here. So here's another picture of the cross vein. Um, they're pretty, I mean, the structures are sized based on the stream. Um, so this one is in a pretty large stream. So it's a, it's a large structure, but they're really um, beneficial in not having those erosive um, turns like we have in the in the picture that I'd shown you of your existing conditions. We want to try and eliminate those. Um, so here is another structure that we'll be using on the project. It's a, a riffle with boulders and wood. So a riffle is a shallow section of the stream where water water runs fast over and around rocks. Um, and it's important because it'll help provide habitat to aquatic life. And um, it changes the flow regime too. We don't wanna have the same kind of flow everywhere in the stream, we wanna vary it because that's what natural channel design is. Channel or streams like vary, um, they have pools, they have riffles, runs and glides. So we wanna try to implement as many of those um, as would be in a normal, 
like natural stream. Um, so this is another picture of a ripple. Um, so then I wanted to show you guys some construction examples. Um, so just so you have an idea of what, what's going to be happening in your backyards. Um, this is what a construction entrance looks like. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to be impacting any sidewalks or not, but if you are, we're able to work around that by providing like a walkable surface for people to walk on, use. Um, so this is going to be where trucks are entering and leaving the site. Um, this is where materials are going to be delivered. This is where construction um, equipment is going to be dropped off. It's, sounds, it's a construction entrance. Um, so here is sort of like what one of our access roads looks like. So we're not able to just build in the stream and access in the stream. We're going to have to build some construction access roads so that we're able to deliver material um, to and from the construction sites. Um, so with our access roads, we have um, these timber mats that um, are like wood planks almost. So it kind of builds like a bridge on top of the roots. So we try to reduce the damage to the trees that are gonna be around it. Um, we'll have some orange fencing around the, the project site. So everybody knows to not kind of disturb that area. Um, Greg, when you are talking about your portion, can you describe where the construction entrances are gonna be? Awesome. Um, so here is, again, the picture of those timber roads that I was talking about. Um, there, so I think on this site, we're gonna actually be able to utilize the sanitary sewer line easement that you have on there, which is really good because the awesome thing about sanitary easements are, is that there aren't a lot of trees planted on them. And if there are trees there, they should be removed because we wanna keep those areas like as accessible as possible in case a sanitary main breaks, then we're able to get crews out there efficiently and quickly so that we can, we can fix that. Um, so with this project, luckily there are sanitary easements and we're gonna be able to utilize those. Um, so that'll help reduce the tree loss as well. Here is um, sort of what the stream is gonna look like immediately after it's completed. Uh, we use, this matting, um, it's biodegradable. Um, and this will help stabilize the area. So if it rains immediately afterwards, all of our work isn't gonna be washed out. It's gonna be like locked in more with this matting here. And it's gonna help um, like once the grass starts growing and the roots get established, then that'll help hold the stream together. Um, but until then, this, this stabilization matting is, is what we use. And then over time it will degrade and then eventually um, not be there anymore. So here is a picture of what uh, construction typically looks like. This is an excavator um, and this is also an excavator um, and they will instead of just like bulldozing this whole area um, they'll use excavators to come in and only do the work where we need them to do, to do the work and kind of be a little more precise than I guess what is typically associated with construction projects, we try, to, we try to minimize our impact as much as possible. Um, and that is with equipment. So I know in Justin's projects, he is a big fan of like pushing the contractor to reduce his impact by using smaller equipment like this. I mean, there are definitely times where you need to use the big machinery because as you saw in like the pictures of the cross vein, like we use really big boulders and the only way to move those are with these big equipment. But doing some small channel side grading, like we can definitely get these little pieces of equipment in there. So Justin's really good at that. And I'm sure that's something that he's gonna bring into this project. So I think that's really good. Um, and then here's an example of a completed project over time. So this is right when, when the stream has been completed or the construction has been completed, uh, we took a picture. Um, and then these two arrows kind of indicate reference trees. Um, so this is the fall and growing season. As you can see, uh, we've come in and we've planted with all of our native plantings. 
Um, so our plantings are, um, we plant to the Fairfax County and Chesapeake Bay um, standards, which means that we're gonna be planting a lot of plants in your backyards or I mean, in the project area. Um, and then in some cases, we may overplant some specific areas. So this is what the site will look like, look like um, the first growing season after, after the project's been completed. And then here's what it looks like one year after, as you can see, the vegetation is establishing a lot more um, and it's looking, looking more natural. Um, and then three years after, like you can really see the amount of effort that we put into um, the plantings. Um, as you can see, they're all growing up. And then one other cool thing that we do is we will plant live stakes along the stream. So a live stake is like a live branch of a tree um, and we'll plant it right along the stream bank line. Um, and the species that we use are really, they really like being in the water. Um, so they grow very fast. Um, so we'll plant the whole stream bank with them and that's gonna help um, produce shade over the water sooner than what these other plants along the edges of the stream will. Um, so then here are some more before and after pictures of, so you can see like what our projects will look like. So this one is Big Rocky Run um, and what it looks like one year after. Uh, here is Rabbit Branch. Um, Rabbit Branch was one of the projects where we tried to minimize our tree loss. Um, we tried to minimize tree loss and we're able to preserve a lot of the canopy, as you can see, like this area is shaded. Um, so that's really good because we want to try and keep the stream shaded as much as we can because that'll help lower the temperature and it'll help improve um, all the aquatic life. And then here is a picture of Banks Park. And as I told you earlier, like three years after um, construction, like you can really see our vegetation taking off. So I think that's, that's all I got for now. Um, stop sharing. Okay. It's all you, Greg. All right, let me share my screen. Um, that last question was what size um, is relevant? And um, I think Shannon, one of the earlier ones when she was showing the cross veins uh, is probably the closest, but this is a, a large uh, channel. So um, it, uh, it'll, it'll have its own size. All right, do you see the map here, the wetland map? Shannon, I sorry, I wasn't looking. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so, oops, let's see here. This, um, let me, yeah, let me start with this. So this is the project area. Um, we have, you know, she showed, uh, Shannon showed an area of the study. And what that was, was we looked at all of the um, stream area and all of the floodplain valley. A lot of that is wetland, um, different types of wetland. And um, up here, this is uh, Sherwood Hall and uh, Mason Hill up top. So that's the start of the area we looked at. And then down through Sherwood Hall, down across Fort Hunt, turns into Paul Spring for the project, down to the end where the Paul Spring branch ends at the confluence, and then all the way down to Collingwood Road. So, um, what this, you know, what what we looked at was all the trees and wetlands and looked at our archaeology, um, lots of different um, different disciplines and lots of things were looked at. Uh, we also looked at all the hydrology, the hydraulics, we modeled the channel, we looked at floodplains. And, you know, we given a project that's around two miles long, uh, crossing different culverts and different areas. Uh, different floodplain widths. We experienced a lot of different um, uh, features around there, uh, including the, the wetlands that you see up top in the project. There's, there's a few spotty wetlands, a lot of trees. There are a good amount of invasive um, species. It's kind of taken over trees, especially in this area along 
Fort Hunt, uh, where that walking path is. You know, that's this is that walking path along there. Um, so we get into some like uh, functional wetlands. You see the green is high, uh, functional pink, and then and then yellow for that limited disturbed wetlands. So we get some some wetland, but not the highest of quality. But as we get down further uh, into the, the, the chunk of the Paul Spring Branch Parkway section, we have a lot of, of good for it. We've got forested wetland. Um, and that continues down past the confluence. Um, just for reference, you know, Paul Spring Branch is everything down to this confluence here. And then the Northwest Branch of Little Hunting Creek, which back in the George Washington photo was that top corner there. Um, we kind of look at this as a tributary because it has a lot smaller drainage area, even though it is uh, the Northwest Branch of Little Hunting Creek proper. And then below the conf confluence down, this is all uh, that Northwest Branch of Little Hunting Creek. Um, this is a coastal plain stream. So we have a very low gradient, which is good. That gives us a lot more um, freedom to uh, be smart with our design here. Um, let me get into my presentation then. So um, this is a section in the channel. Um, I'll get into this area later, but you can see the channel. Uh, we mentioned reference reach. We mentioned the 15 foot wide and the, you know, really like a foot and a half deep. And you see that that's kind of what has happened in an uh, area here. And I'll get into why that happened. But there are portions of this that are in good condition and we're not looking to, to touch um, you know, at all, given that. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, we mentioned before the sewer access. So while she was talking, I kind of moved this up just to show this is the sewer easement corridor running through most of the project. And this is what we'll be using uh, for that construction access. So just wanted to show you what that area looks like now, like I said, it's already clear to trees and if not, it needs to be um, for their access. So we talked about the, the watershed, um, the area. Um, this is the watershed and the land use. And you can see from that, the, the highest part of that is low density residential, which makes sense at the area. But as you know, uh, most of this is impervious area, it has a decently high impervious percentage in the watershed and um, and reinforcing that you know here's a quick image of what it looks like when you have a uncontrolled watershed and an unprotected stream you know a small amount of impervious looks pretty nice you get into 20 percent you're impaired you get above 30 percent you start to see those vertical banks which we run into a lot uh, in this project but we do experience almost all conditions in this project so I want to get into our um, approach. Um, one thing I want to show before that is the, um, you know, this is the FEMA map. This is not our work in any way. This is the FEMA map. Uh, you can see the project Mason Hill, Sherwood Hall, down and around. And, and you can see how broad the floodplain is uh, now, uh, according to FEMA. And the watershed we were talking about uh, when we get to that confluence here at the confluence of the two channels, we're close to two square miles. And when we get to the bottom at Collinwood, um, we're at 2.64 square miles. So we're looking at, you know, the 1% chance, which is typically the 100 year, we're in the range of, you know, three to 4,000 CFS, which is a, a sizable number. But given the floodplain access, um, it's something that doesn't get going too fast, but it does, it does flood pretty well. So for our approach, um, as was mentioned, it's going to vary throughout, and I'm going to break it down into those areas and show you that. And in general, uh, we're going to utilize that existing channel, um, even areas where we're barely going to touch. Uh, there are some areas that will need channel realignment, and that's to preserve the private land. Sometimes the stream has already crossed over the line doesn't care where the property line is and it's crossed over and is you know influencing some infrastructure private and public um, and then the use of the riffle grade control like Shannon showed you um, and using those uh, in a raised condition to get us back to that dimension where we're closer to the top of the bank and we're not that four or five foot deep 
channel that really can't get out and creates a lot of erosion in our frequent storms. Um, and then there is the potential on that Northwest branch um, tributary, as we call it, of realigning that. Uh, that's gonna depend on uh, some design decisions and some property owners uh, input as well. So, so here is, uh, we have very good aerial imagery. I wanted to show you the overall project and see how long this is. And at this scale, it's hard to see anything. So I've broken it all up. Um, there are different areas that we're dealing with. This is what I'm calling the Sherwood Hall area um, because it's above and below and it's definitely influenced by the culverts and another private driveway that's up here. Um, then we have the area that's the reference reach uh, condition where you notice there really, we don't have any roads or any work going on there. Uh, we break it down here into where we have an area where we need to protect some infrastructure. And then where we're getting into where we have good wetland on the adjacent side, but we're disconnected, we're much lower than it. It does reach there uh, in storms, it backs up and it does reach over but you'll see in some photos and whatnot, we're, we're several feet away from that being a good connection. Um, this is the tributary in the upper part. Uh, that's a, it has its own design approach. And then from this confluence down, we come down and there's a bridge around right here. We'll talk about that. Kind of the channel changes a little bit around there. And then we have the last uh, channel down to Collingwood Road. And as I go through that, I'm gonna show where the limited disturbance is um, the preservation of you know, existing trees. You can see all the trees. You can see how the LOD is minimal inside there. And I can show the access points. So this is that upper Sherwood Hall area. And this is one of those parts where we are likely to realign the channel some, not greatly. We're not taking it and moving it across the valley, but there are some spots where you can see here it's going up against property lines. There's some fences being uh, impacted. And we're looking at a couple options still. We're early enough in the process that uh, no, no, made, you know, no final decisions have been made other than the general approach and in the areas. So you can see in here there's, there's option A and option B and they're kind of crossing um, you know, different choices. Access stays the same. Um, but I was going to show that um, you know, this is the area upstream of the project. And there is a um, private driveway culvert, which is very small compared to the flow. Uh, what this does is it backs up the flow and it keeps this upper area uh, in you know, very good condition. And um, we're really not gonna touch that. And, um, but when you get below it, it starts to come out faster, that culvert. Uh, there's areas here where uh, concrete's been poured, walls have been built, and those are being damaged. Again, um, you see that bank erosion. Uh, you know, we're, we're high enough up that you can see we're, you know, around three or four feet deep at this point. And you can see later on, we get a lot deeper as we get deeper into the, the watershed. Um, you know, areas where fences are impacted and tarps are trying to be used to protect um, their people's private property. And these are some of those areas that um, we would be looking um, to move. Um, so again, that is this upper area, um, which is that Sherwood Hall. And again, this is that part where we're going to be realigning somewhat. Um, now, as for, actually, I'm going to come back later on and show the access on an even more zoomed in version. Um, it's just hard to show detail at this scale of a project. So I'm going to work our way closer and closer. Um, so then we break into where we have the reference reach. Uh, kind of a unique situation occurred out there um, that made this area a, a lot better. But you see that we are coming in in a few spots just to uh, improve some uh, drainage and other sorts of um, infrastructure that needs some improvement. But in general, staying out of that area, blocking, stopping the access paths, and um, you know, we have an area above it and an area below it. Um, reason why this happened was back in 2002, some work was done in the area, and one of the a, a, a vortex weir, which was a, a cross vein, like Shannon showed, uh, was raised. It was put in and, and had boulders sticking up, and it kind of blocked the channel. 
Um, and that was done when they had some gabion work and other things were done, but that Vox Vortex weir was put in at the top. And what happened, um, you know, that's actually right at the edge of the screen here. So that's where that was installed. I think it's right across from this house. And what that did was that backed up uh, the channel uh, to where it is at the, the right height. It is actually more towards that one and a half, two foot depth. Um, you know, it backfilled in on logs. So we have nice natural log toes. Um, you know, you can see the trees, These, this tree was undermined and then the channel refilled and filled back up underneath the tree. And you have a, a, a very stable condition uh, created by that. But like I mentioned, and you can see this pipe had been undercut and was failing. And then when the stream raised back up again, now it's, it's halfway buried. So this is one of those areas we're gonna come in and fix the outfall, um, but pretty minor work to do there. Now below that, we don't have that benefit of that rock vortex weir that trapped sediment and kept it from all flowing downstream and eroding and, and had it degrade back up there. So here we have a situation where the channel is degrading and we have um, infrastructure that's being impacted. Um, there are spots where we have a wider valley, it gets tight in some areas, it opens up, but this is an area where we have failed outfalls uh, as the stream dropped, the outfall dropped with it. Um, this is that Gabian area. And then we have exposed sewers as the stream moved over and exposed manholes that were nice and safe and tucked in on the bank and buried. And now you, know, you have four or five feet of a manhole sticking up in the middle of the stream, as well as the stream eroding on bends getting close to Sherwood Hall. So uh, we are, we are this is an area where we're going to stay in the channel as much as possible. Um, you can see that with these areas, only these two areas are we considering kind of popping out and getting it away from uh, infrastructure, um, but in general, staying in that channel, but protecting, um, protecting infrastructure. And, um, you know, in this area, away from the infrastructure, you can see it's, it's over widened and, and it's disconnected. It's a couple feet, you know, eight feet below the floodplain. Um, so what, we, what we're planning to do in this area and down um, is to put in cross veins and riffles and different structures to raise that channel up and uh, allow for the, the sediment and the source and the rock, the cobble that's coming from the upper watershed, because it's such a big watershed, allowing that to back up and serve as some of our channel fill here. So rather than us importing all this material and filling it, uh, part of the approach to this is that we'll create blockages that will uh, over time aggrade and create the channel like happened upstream. So we're trying to make the maximum impact over a large area with the least amount of um, you know, disturbance and at an affordable price. Here's an example of how far down the channel disconnected that outfall used to be near the channel top or near the channel elevation and channel drop and maintenance has come in and poured some riprap in to keep that uh, outfall from failing. So kind of now moving downstream almost to the confluence, it's pretty similar. This is an area where we have uh, great forested wetlands and a lot of uh, side channels. You know, mentioned the uh, braided channels and whatnot. We have those up in these wetlands, but the main channel here is disconnected. And um, our goal is to get those to uh, connect better to each other. These white areas, you can see this is a spot where we're really looking to just pop in and create that, that riffle, that channel blockage and get those up. And we're, you know, these aren't all of it. This isn't finalized, but those are where we'd be spacing these channels up. It's a little bit too, many, too, too, inf uh, too much information here, but we're balancing with the floodplain constantly. Uh, we're trying to not create a rise uh, for any, any properties as much as we can. So uh, as we do this, um, you know, we're really trying to um, you know, not really come in and flood. So we, the spacing and the height of these are pretty sensitive to where we get close to um, 
impacting. And again, we're early enough in the process that we're still playing with inch here and inch there, or half foot there, just to make sure that we can get the best design at the least impact to uh, adjacent properties. Um, so as you can see, we're, we're in this area, it's a little deeper. There's lots of debris blockages and different things that come and go. Uh, we've been out there you know, on and off several times over the last year. And some of these are in there, you can't get past and we come back a few months later and, and they're all gone. Um, and then come back later on and a new one's back. So these are some of the things that we're gonna be looking at. And that's, you know, that's due to trees failing on the banks and then falling in and creating these blockages. Um, you can see something that's important as you get down, we get further, uh, the material changed. You see up top, there's a lot of larger cobble. Um, that's all gotten blocked by those debris blockages and different things. So as we get down in the channel, uh, the material gets smaller, but that's also because as we get further in the project, we're approaching tidal uh, flow and therefore, you know, we're just into an area where we have smaller material. Um, so we get down to that confluence that I keep talking about. To the right is you know, the upstream Paul Spring, Spring Branch. I'm standing at the downstream end and up to the left there, uh, the smaller channel is that um, the Northwest Branch and the obligatory uh, tire in the channel um, as every project has. So now we get below the confluence and just mentioning we're coming down to the bridge. Um, and this is kind of that same approach where we're trying to fill in the channel, get the channel higher, uh, reconnect it to that floodplain, but balancing that um, with uh, not increasing the, the hundred year uh, elevation. And note, you know, the, it seems counterintuitive that I can shrink the channel and not have an impact, but given the amount of floodplain and floodplain width, um, then when you get into the higher flows, it, it really gets down to just a few inches of change as we mess with the channel because most of the flow in the higher storms is, is in the floodplain. Um, so that this is right below the, the confluence. You can see this is similar to the picture that Shannon showed earlier. We just have that exposed bank. Any sort of storm comes through, it's just going to eat at that bank and it's going to move that sediment down, down into the channel and down into the bay. There has been work in this section before imbricated walls were installed and we're not planning to change those after that effort's already been put in. Uh, we might work around that a little, but that is, um, you know, that, that's more of that protocol five that Shannon, or four that Shannon mentioned. And, um, you know, that's really not our approach to this project, but in some places this is needed and that's what those imbricated walls look like you're really trying to protect something and you just have nowhere else to go. Um, and then this is the, the pedestrian bridge that kind of breaks up this reach here. And I'm gonna pause here and talk about that. As part of this project, we are looking to replace this bridge. Um, there are similar, a lot of the projects have pedestrian bridge crossings. So here's an example of a project completed recently. Um, this is pretty similar to the type of bridge that we'd be using and the elevation of that, you know, sometimes we have a little ramp up bridge, little ramp down. So this is the type of uh, bridge that will be used to replace that existing pedestrian bridge. So just wanted that's a, a separate point and a focus on this project is to replace that bridge. So now below that channel, um, you know, you can see more of the same but we are getting into an area here um, that uh, is starting to have influence of the tidal flow downstream. And there's also beavers downstream that have come up and are influencing the uh, channel. So um, you can see, and um, you know, here's a spot where the floodplain is actually under someone's deck. Um, and you know, we would, the floodplain would remain, but the channel location uh, might change slightly and you have that gabion to protect you there. Um, and as we move down, there are also exposed manholes in this area. Um, so that would be protected as well. And I mentioned the, the beaver activity. You can see how the channel in this area is again, uh, not as disconnected. And that's because of uh, aggradation to the stream uh, based on a beaver dam that comes and goes that they've been working on for years just below this area. 
And then as we approach the end of the project towards the culverts of um, Collingwood Road, um, you can see it's still just like a straight channel. It doesn't have that diversity that we want. You know, it's not natural in that way. So we would be uh, creating that geometry improvement here and uh, fixing up some of these banks that are just vertical and non-vegetated. So you know, classic before picture and Shannon shows you what they look like after when we come in and fix the slope and, and plant them. Um, and then lastly, the tributary, the, the upper Northwest branch uh, to the Little Hunting Creek. Right now, this is uh, highly influenced. It's straight, it's running right behind the property lines. There's a few places where it drops. Um, there's some bridges crossing it. You can see it's a pretty small channel. Um, you know, there's an open area to the east and different bridges and whatnot put across, um, you know, a couple of big drops. And then at the bottom, there is some, you know, more, more elaborate uh, bridge structures. So, um, you know, again, looking here, we're looking to either work in that channel and fix that up and give it more uh, diversity or possibly even relocating. And this is kind of, you know, this is the only area where we're talking about switching the channel over into where there's other flow paths. Uh, but since it's such a small channel, uh, it would be a pretty small impact to weave in a new channel through that area. Um, so if I jump to that, I wanted to show um, a little uh, map here. So back at the top then, um, you know, here, Here's the area above uh, Sherwood Hall. Um, you know, one this is an area where it's difficult to get in. I know access has been discussed. There is an existing um, road down to there is a gas line down here and, and protected utility. Um, so this is a location that um, we've looked at the probably the best way in, maybe the only way into this upper area. Uh, coming off of the right of way. Uh, it's pretty steep over here. Uh, it'd be hard to get through. And then other areas, um, you know, this already has a ramp built. So this would be access off of Fort Hunt to get to the upper area. You know, coming down to the next section, there's a decent spot to come in here off of Sherwood Hall. Uh, again, not on anyone else's property using the, the parkland. And that would get us into the area. And that allows us to um, come down. I don't know if, you, if you've walked on that hiking path. You can see this is one of the major outfalls coming in. And we're going to work in that area. You see the orange shape. That's the LOD. Um, you can see it's very tight to the channel as much as possible. And then tight to the access road, uh, which is, again, typically following the sewer line if we can. If not, the access road is following gaps we've found in the forest. Uh, where there aren't large trees or uh, high quality wetland and, and we can kind of slide through there without impacting very much. And then um, at the bottom end, the other way into this area is off the beginning of Paul Spring Parkway. And if you've walked into the stream valley, this is probably the most common way in. Uh, it's right at grade, it's very close, easy to get into. So it's a pretty simple access point. Um, and moving down, I mentioned the reference reach where we weren't uh, going to do much work, but we wanted to get to that outfall. Just a simple access in to do some repair work. We may need to do a little bit in through here too. Um, we can traverse the channel uh, in some places. So if we needed to, we could come up and down and, and not impact that forest. So as we get down past that, um, there is access point coming here. Um, this is probably the only one coming off of the, the opposite side from Paul Spring Branch. And then switch to the next map. Um, that gets us down and in. And so that's kind of a one way in and out to that spot. And then, um, then we also, again, disconnect because there's a section of good channel and we don't need to drive the access road through. Um, and then back to where um, other access coming in off of Sherwood Hall. Notice the LOD here is pretty big. That's because there's a really wide open area and we're looking to use that as the uh, one of the major staging areas. 
Um, so that's the one way in there. And that's, we'll ride that out all the way till we get down to the confluence. And um, if we can, we try to connect the sewer lines coming over on this side here. And um, another way into this area is the Colonial Woods Drive at the end of that road. Uh, that's a good spot that we're looking at to get in. That's where I flipped down too far. Access to the upper trib would be right here off of Sherwood Hall. And then coming down again, Col Colonial Woods gets us into that area and we run that down to where kind of have a impassable area with wetland and, and, and uh, the features. So um, that would break and um, the other access here would be off of Collingwood Road. Um, this one's pretty tight and um, we're still looking at that and um, would have to you know, work with uh, VDOT as well since that's there right away to get in. Um, and then the culverts that will be uh, likely dredging out. So. Again, those are the access points, and you can see, um, you know, that orange being the LOD where it's it's tight to where we're working, it's tight to the stream, and you know, you don't see we're not taking big swaths out of the uh, valley to relocate the stream, or like Shannon mentioned, you know, protocol two, which we're not doing to cut out to create that floodplain. Our approach is more of that protocol one getting it, uh, getting the channel up to where it's closer to the existing floodplain. So um, my last topic is the floodplain mapping and the, um, the easement locations, those existing easement locations. Um, you know, I mentioned we've, we've done a lot of modeling and, and you know, in studies, uh, both environmental studies and then hydraulic, geomorpho geomorphological um, hydraulic, this is our cross-section map of just the area of the cross of the, of the confluence. Um, and that's what feeds into all of the models. And, you know, we looked at the FEMA years and our own years and compared everything and we're, we're very close to their boundaries. Um, so with that, I'm gonna show you the best way I can show this level of detail um, uh, for a project this large is just flipping through our field flip, flip book. Basically, we built this system to make our way through the whole channel um, you know, using 13 tiles. Um, that represents, you know, we can, like I said, these are these upper areas, uh, Mason Hill, that's that private drive. We get to Sherwood Hall. So, you know, I can, I'll walk you down here and show you, but what we're seeing here is areas where um, the this orange and red line, this is our modeled existing and proposed. And you can see they're basically on top of each other. Uh, we just shift them a little bit so you can see both lines. Um, they typically don't really change um, off each other uh, because we're not creating uh, much rise there. But you can see how these floodplain lines um, and are past the property line. This dashed red line is the FEMA line uh, and, and county line of the, the model previously without all the detail that we have. And, um, and you can see moving down there, they're similar. There's spots like this where we are inside, we, we're not raising higher than what FEMA says but we just have better topography now than they had when those things were developed. So even though we're in an elevation below them, we know that these contours come around. So we have uh, you know, a couple spots where we are, you know, again, lower than them, but physically on a map, we kind of teeter in and out of where FEMA said the line was because they were using like five foot contours and we're using half foot contours. Um, so on that, you know, here's areas where, you know, we have the property line out here. This blue, uh, this the deep blue color here is where there's easements already. So, um, you know, here's a situation where we have, you know, the FEMA line was here, uh, which kind of comes in and out. The easements that were granted a long time ago kind of weave in. And then here's a spot where our modeling with the uh, better topography shows that we dipped outside of an easement. Uh, so there's situations like that occasionally where there was an easement in place and now with better modeling, we 
are a little bit beyond the easement. And that's one of the situations that we, we need to talk to people about. Um, whereas here's you know another one where the FEMA line was here, the easement's here, and our model shows that we're well inside that. So there's no change, the easement's already in place. Um, so there's no, no impact to that. Um, so that, that's a pretty similar, uh, pretty consistent situation. FEMA was in here, easements were purchased for the floodplain before, and then our modeling shows that we're still well within that area and there's no change. But there's spots, you know, where uh, you get a side channel and our, our floodplain bumps out. You know, here's one of those other examples where uh, the easement was here, FEMA was here, but our modeling, even though we're at the same elevation or lower than FEMA in the model, uh, topography shows that we outside of the easement. So there's that that's basically you know reoccurs over and over where we're either within the easements in place, uh, we're slightly bumping out of them because of topography and not because we're raising it below above what was there before, but just because of topography. Um, but there are instances out here as well where the existing floodplain is um, existing floodplain is actually on private land, but there is no easement in place. So those are kind of the categories that we're looking at where there's not an easement there now and we need one. There is an easement there now and it's not changing or there is an easement there now and we might, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing that there's a blip where we're coming outside of that zone. So those are the floodplain easements as well as, um, you know, the need just to get into the work area most of the work is on parkland, um, but you know when the stream has already crossed over onto private land and we need to get it back, then um, that's where we'll be touching into private land as well for temporary construction easements. So Shannon, that's all I really had talking about floodplain easements. You know we can look at individual areas and different things, but um, not going to walk us down two miles of uh, property yeah. boundary. Totally <laughs> Um, do you have a map that shows where the sanitary sewer easement is? Um, is it shown on any of your big ones or just on the plan set? I don't think it's on my big ones. Let me see if I can find that. I think I might have something. I'll try to bring that up. I'm going to stop presenting. So. Um, but I can talk while you search. Okay. Um, so I'm Um, so somebody mentioned in the chat, um, what like a comparable stream to Fall Spring at Truewood Hall is, um, here is a picture of one of the projects we did, um, it's called Flatlick, um, and it is a similar size to what Paul Springs is. So this is our project five years out, um, from when it was constructed, as you can see, like the banks are pretty stable. Um, the vegetation has grown in really well. Um, so just an idea of what your stream could look like in the future. Um, so the next steps for this project are going to be to complete the stream. So we've already completed the stream assessment and the pre-design analysis. Um, we're having um, our pre-design conceptual public meeting right now. Um, then we're going to be working on land rights. Um, there are about 22 easements that we're gonna need to acquire um, based on that new floodplain analysis that AMT performed. Um, so this um, new easements that we're getting, it's not, it's just based on the new data that we received with our survey and then updating the floodplain maps to accommodate where the actual floodplain is. Um, and then with our design, we're gonna be able to hopefully match those existing floodplain, like the revised floodplain elevations that we're getting. Um, so, Right now, we are performing title searches on all the properties that we're gonna be needing to acquire those easements in. And then once our land acquisition 
division has a chance to review all those title searches to make sure what easements are there, then we're gonna be able to determine what easements we actually need. So once that is decided, we're gonna start preparing plats. Um, land acquisition is gonna review them. And then we're gonna start reaching out to all the property owners that are gonna be, that we'll have to have new easements on. Um, so for now, that project is gonna be on hold or the project is gonna be on hold until we obtain all the easements that we need. Um, and the more easements that we're able to get, um, the more functional our restoration is gonna be. So like I said, if we can get all 22, then we can give you a really good product. Um, but if we're not able to get that, then we're not gonna be able to achieve all the, all the goals that we need. So, um, so yeah, Justin and our land acquisition department should be reaching out to everybody um, soon. So then after that, assuming we can get everything we need, we'll move forward with the concept design, um, which should happen sometime in the spring. And then we'll move on to final design, which should occur by winter in 2022. And then we'd move on to construction. Um, but this is gonna be dependent on the available, available funding for the project. Um, so we only, we have a limited budget um, so once we get the, um, the funding, then we'll be able to move forward, but we have a, a plan for that. So should be accounted for. Um, so the easement is typically it's going to be a floodplain easement or it's going to be a storm water easement. Um, and that's going to allow us to... Um, use that portion of the property um, for the stream. If there's any work that needs to be done on it, um, we'll be able to access that property. Um, one other thing that I wanted to talk about is non-native invasive treatments. Um, I know that there have been some questions about that so far. Uh, we are very early in design um, and usually we don't start doing the treatments until a little later, but once we get the 35% design plans or the concept design plans, which on the schedule looks like it'll be winter 2021. Um, we will start evaluating which areas of the site we want to go in and do some pre-treatments on. Um, and then we'll look at like the public properties. And then if we need to, we'll start looking at the private properties as well. Um, and I also saw some questions in the chat about setting up meetings um, to come out and look at some properties. Um, I really appreciate everybody being interested in this project. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Justin just had a baby, a new baby. Um, so he is gonna be taking off the next week at least. Um, but then I think he's gonna start coming back part-time um, at some point within the next two weeks. So once he's back part-time, um, he'll be able to set up some meetings with you guys so he can come out, look at your property and kind of see what you guys are seeing so we can um, adjust the design if we can. Um, and it's also very early in the project. So this is the time to bring up your concerns because we have the flexibility to adjust our designs now. Whereas if you wait until we're at the final design, it's gonna be really hard to change what we're doing then. So the sooner you see something that you want different, the like you should say it then rather than holding it back. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to ask or mention um, is that we need volunteers um, from the Civic Association, the neighborhood, and um, like other community groups that are interested in the project to join our advisory committee. Um, so if you are interested in being a part of this advisory committee, um, it's gonna, I guess the commitment is gonna be like a couple hours a month or every other month when we have design meetings, when we receive plans from AMT, it'll be kind of reviewing the plans, distributing, distributing them to your neighbors or other organization members 
um, so that everybody, and then compiling their comments and sharing it with the design team during our design meetings. Um, so that way we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to do it. And there are a lot of um, homeowners and individuals in this community. So it's not really, um, so having like a community representative is really important for us because we want to get the information out there and we want to hear what your opinions are. Um, so if you're interested in this, um, it'd be great if you could send Justin an email. Um, here's some online resources um, if you're interested. And this website is going to be posted on the, or this PowerPoint is going to be posted on the project website. And then we're also probably going to post the recording if you want to listen to it again. Um, but here is Justin's contact information. His email is justinpastori at fairfaxcounty.gov. Um, so you can send him a meeting request um, so that he can take a tour of your backyard with you. Um, or if you just have any questions about the project, um, Justin is definitely the one to reach out to. And like I said, he'll probably be back um, in like two weeks or so to answer your questions. Did you see, did you find the sewer easement, Greg? Yeah, I just kind of made a uh, graphic here while we were talking. So let me take over the share again. Yep. Uh, there we go, it's the right screen. So this is actually like our design plan. Um, you know, I know that's different to look at. It doesn't have the colors, um, but um, you, know, you can see the work, the area and the access road in gray. And then here's the, in magenta is the sewer easement. Um, you know, obviously there's parts where we're not following it because we're not over there. You can tell here, access road, sewer easement. Um, you know, here's a section where the sewer easement was kind of far away and in, in people's, uh, right in people's backyards. So we actually created a, a different spot. But in general, um, you know, here, we pick back up following the easement uh, access road, basically down the easement, except for when it goes into the channel here. And then, um, uh, yeah, you know, so in general, like we said, the access road is basically mm -hmm. riding that sewer as much as we can. Um, so. Can you show the southernmost property, southernmost portion of the project when it, there was a question? Do you want to see it in color or in... I do it in color. Okay. Bring up the super map then. Okay. So um, just bank work and spots. I, and I apologize, the, the blue line is, you know, uh, from an aerial and whatnot. So the stream channel is actually, like right here, this is actually the bank. So you see the green is us doing bank work and um, mm -hmm. something there. And the channel actually widens beyond where that blue line is. So uh, we're not showing all the contours in the stream channel for this image, but, um, but this is basically that area. Or we can look at it. Um, here. So what this has the contours on, you can tell. Okay. Was there something in specific that you wanted to look at here? Oops. I just said to show the Collingham Road area, Collingwood Road area. Yeah. So hopefully that helps. You can see again, channel over um, on private land. Are we gonna have access right there? That, yeah, we're trying to figure out where we can get down in. Um, we were looking here, cause that gets us on this high side. But okay. we know that this is one, um, you know, where, I guess there's the driveway entrance right here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it looks like um, there might be some mature vegetation in there. So I think that's probably something that we wanna look at in the field. Um, just to check out what kind of trees and 
vegetation is over there, maybe we can um, shift the alignment of that entrance to avoid the really high quality vegetation. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we, you know, we in general are dodging all the larger trees, but we will, you know, we, we'll go out and walk this and, and refine okay. this channel over time. You know, we, we, we try to avoid the tree impacts, but sometimes um, we can either avoid them entirely or sometimes we have to pick and choose. Uh, we try to split and save both trees. We end up damaging both trees. So, you know, uh, something I didn't mention was, you know, we do look at the species. We were, we've done a lot of different looks out there. Uh, in general, you know, uh, beech and, and red maple and oak, you know, we try to keep those. Those are slower to grow. Um, and then tulip poplars are the one that we would, you know, if we had to pick one, we uh, we we pick the tulip poplar. Actually, we made a, a mapping of this entire area and identified all the tulip poplars in red. And Justin went out there and and was so he could pick and choose which ones were, um, you know, the tulip yeah. poplars. You're not just blinded by you know hundreds of trees. We could tell which ones were the, the lower quality species. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very important thing I forgot to mention. Okay. So there's another question when I when I talked to folks that were originally surveying, they explained that the stream would probably be widening towards Paul Springs to ease the speed of water flow. Is that not the case any longer? Um, I think that's a question that you can ask Justin um, when you talk to him about like the design decisions that are being made. Um, I'm sure he'd be willing to uh, listen. Um, and we're, we, do try our best to protect the trees, like I've said a couple of times um, during this presentation. So we'll use the, the tree, the timber matting to help protect the roots um, and then try to protect the, the tree bark and stuff like that um, from the equipment um, and just try to minimize our impacts as much as we can to, to save the trees. Um, but again, if you have concerns about specific areas of the site that are near your house, um, I would definitely recommend reaching out to Justin um, and expressing your concerns to him. Um, I know that he is willing to meet everybody. Um, Um, Sam, I just saw your comment. Um, I would reach out to Justin about that as well. Um, you can walk, walk your property with you. Um, and then I think we can also try to coordinate with the park authority. Um, as well. Okay, I just looked up your property. Um, yeah, I, um, I believe you're where the fence line there. Um, so that was uh, definitely one of the things that we want to talk about, you know, different options, which is keep it where we are, but protect it at the property line or before the property line, uh, or relocate the channel like option one here in blue, which gets it completely again away from the property line there. So yes, you are, um, I see that you're definitely a property where the stream is 
encroaching towards your your land. And um, that's definitely a spot where we're gonna block it or move it. Um, so and sure. thank you for expressing your concerns now. We appreciate it. I, didn't, I forgot I wasn't uh, sharing there, but so I bring the image up for that location. So that's the so 16, <laughs> sorry. 16, 17, right? Yeah, so that was the, the last comment. 1629 um, is also one of the properties in question, and it's located on the match line of one of the sheets, so there isn't yeah. the best yeah. view of it, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, do you have any comments on that, Greg? Um, no, just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you to get that, get the channel away from your property there, and you know, the <laughs> sewer is there as well, so. Uh, yeah, you can see it's crossing over the boundary. So um, we would definitely would like your input as we develop this design. Because mm -hmm. we want to we want to come up with a product that everybody is going to be happy with at the end, or at least livable with. Um, so, like I said, working with you now is ideal. Um. Are there any more comments? Yeah, yeah. Match lines are they're always in the worst spot. So, no matter what sure that probably put something together when Justin meets with you that isn't in between two pages. Yeah. Um, so if you guys do have any questions, feel free to email Justin um, and he will reach out to you when he's back to work. Um, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Thank you very much. Um, is Sam still in the meeting? I see Sam's iPad. I think so. Might be. I'm just wondering if Sam's iPad is um, up on the tributary or not, but it sounds like it. I think it was 1617. Okay, okay. That's the same one. Okay. Defense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to end the meeting. I hope you all have a great e evening. All right. Thanks, everyone.